Good evening. We are coming to you from the Egyptian Church of Karast, Christ Incorporated. This program is for one group of people and one group only, the children of God. We no longer have to wonder or wander off the straight path. For those who want to make a difference, for those that want to know the truth to so many unanswered questions, and for those who are tired of the devil taking control over everything in their lives and the lives of their children, this program is set up for those who want to be in God's kingdom here on earth. According to the scriptures, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore we must take back control of our lives. We the Egyptian Church of Karast Christ Incorporated are reaching out to embrace all the children of God as it states in Psalms chapter 82 verse 6, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Next you will be listening to our pastor, Reverend Dr. Malachi Z. York L. in question and answer form. Genesis as a fully Caucasian thing. They didn't look at those as uh, Nubian people. The ancient Egyptians saw all that, the whole Adam and Eve story, as the birth of a new race of people who had wars amongst themselves and the tribe of Abel was born against the tribe of Cain and Cain deceived him and did wrong by him and it was supposed to be in a fair battle like if two men get into a ring and they're fighting a martial arts battle because they're supposed to represent their tribe and like in a circle of iron, I cheat just because I want to win. And when the referee says, take a break, I bite your ear off, right? And I start to cheat and I think I should win. Well, that's what Cain did not follow the laws of the order that they were trying to be initiated into because they were being transformed into Elohim. And he never made it. He went the other direction. And in Genesis chapter four, from 24 to about 28, we'll tell you the whole story of how he was not respected and how he was transformed into the devil. Because it literally says that if you do the right thing, everything be cool. But if you persist on violating the laws and going against the laws, then sin lies at the door and unto you shall be his desire and you shall rule over him. Meaning the devil will desire to lure you into his world. Once he gets you into his world, you start perpetrating devilishment. You start having your own parties, in other words. First you go out with the intent to go to a party to have fun. When you get to a party, you learn how to have parties. Then you're setting up the parties where people are coming to get drunk. So in ancient Egypt, they looked at that whole episode and Seth as Satuk, and how they worshiped Satuk, another group of people, and it was a totally different philosophy. When we get down to the Sumerian part of it, the Akkadian or Cuneiform part of the doctrine, they are looking at it from the Mizraim chapter. And they're trying to say, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, you'll find that Cush or Ethiopia is mentioned in the Bible before Genesis chapter 10, which means Cush is mentioned before Cush was born. Right? So therefore there was Cushites existing around the Nile and around the uh, Tigris Euphrates Valley before the flood and before Noah was even born. But they have the Bible story where Cush comes out to be a descendant of Noah. You follow? So who is the Cush that we find prior to that? That's because those original people, Cushites, were in Africa. The flood lifted from there and the boat landed over there in Ararat. It didn't start over there, it lifted from Africa and landed there. And then there was a migration of the tribes trying to get back home. And when Mizraim, who was from that tribe, got back into Egypt, he set up the first dynasty and became known as Namir or Menes. When they say Menes as a substitute name for Namir, they're really saying Masra. And Masra is the word they use for Egypt. And the Jews took it over and called it Mizraim. It's Masra Mis and Mizraim. They're all the same word. And that same Namir, if you saw him in any history, they show you him with his hand like this, grabbing a man's hair, with a club in his hand, right? And on the tablet they have. And he's got a certain kind of crown on, very similar to the one you have on. Then if you see the statue of the god Baal, 
or bow, they show him standing in the same position with his hand grasped, but there's nobody in it because that was chipped off of the stellar, and he had the same club in his hand because menace was bow. Bow was Adonis. <laughs> It's all the same people. And that was the original seed of Kush coming back into Africa. When they came back into Africa, one of the people amongst them that was prominent and strong, name was Ham. Ham. So this Ham breeds a tribe called Hamites or Hamites, another group who moved further south or Hamites, become known as Kushites. The ones who stayed up near the Mediterranean Sea become known as Futites, and later on they become Libya. And the ones who settled to the east of that became known as Mitzrayim, and they later called them Egyptians. So the Hamites became known as the Sudanese, the Kushites became known as the Ethiopians, the Futites became known as the Libyans, and the Mitzrayim became known as the Egyptians. And these were names given to them by the Phoenicians and the Greeks, because this wasn't in their own language. You follow? So when we start picking up on those stories, we gotta understand how those migrations took place and how they got over into the Middle East in order to get back over into Egypt. And when they started in Egypt, they came back in with what? With Sumerian customs. So the original indigenous Tarites, the Nubans, who were pygmies, were overthrown by them, and that's why they show you them as servants to the dynastic periods. And that's where Bess was the chief of the Nubans, and he had the powers of a sorcerer. So they didn't bother him. They kept him, and to this very day in Egypt, they have rituals to Bess. They added it in the language without the T as the Bess. That's how afraid they were, the same way that the Italians were afraid when they went to Africa and got involved with the Yoruba. When they went to uh, Cuba, America messed with Cubans, and they was over there dealing with Santa Maria, they backed off. They were like, well, oh, they backed off. They took them months just to get um, Nariego out, and only got him out because he gave up on his day and went to a Catholic church. And that's where they got it. As long as he was working with them Obia, or those Obas, they couldn't touch him. So the Tamil who is petrified of Santeria Yoruba, he wouldn't go near those people. So that was a part of our culture. Those original Pathites, which were in tune with the forces of nature, becomes to them voodoo. Whenever you deal with nature and say, well, I acknowledge the great mother of the sea, be, may you call her Ogun, and I, the god of the air, and the god of the water, and the god of the earth that grows the food that I eat, and the god of the sun. You know, when you start doing that, they freak out and say, oh, you're a pagan. Meanwhile, they have eased paganism into their religion by going to church on Sunday. If I was gonna say they ease it, they're still, you know, and God is the light. They always show Jesus with a big halo over his head or a ring around his head like a sun ray, you know, and that's a symbol of the sun. They're afraid to break away from those spiritual powers. When those people came back from Samaria, they came with all these new costumes on. When they came through Phoenicia, they picked up the headdress of the Irie in Hebrew. Irie is the Hebrew word for lion. In other words, when the people that you meet from Jamaica saying Irie, they're saying lion. Right? That headdress was a sign of the Sphinx. Everybody was getting back to the Sphinx because everybody was waiting for that 25,000 year cycle when the constellation of Leo or the lion would come because the lion would stand up and our so-called history, I have to say history because how they trick the language, or our story would renew itself and we come back into the knowledge of self and kind and a transformation from mortality to immortality will start to take place. And the devil can't handle that. This is what was taking place back then. So they were trying to get back across. And they brought in customs. When they got there, they was confronted by the Taites or the Pathites, the Ethiopian pygmies. And they hated them. So they suppressed them. And they enslaved them. And they took over Egypt and set up a new genetic structure called the 46 dynasties. And during the reign of the 46 dynasties, when they was traveling from land to land teaching, 
way over in the land of Kedmon, which the Bible tells you the original name of Canaan, where a cursed seed of people was there, they called the place El Bras. If you look up in a dictionary on El Bras, you'll find that that's the main seat in the Caucasus Mountain. It's also the word Abras for leprosy in the scriptures. And those Canaanite people who were in someone else's land because their God had given them someone else's land called the land of Canaan, you follow? Decided to go pursue the wealth that they heard about at the now where their God reported to them the gold over there is good. The same way they came out of Europe to America when they heard, when they saw Native Americans with pure gold, and they heard the gold in America was good, and there was a migration of a gold rush. The same thing happened a long time ago. History does tend to repeat itself. Right? So they was coming over there to conquer. So the Hyksos knew they couldn't just come in so uh, and fight the pygmies, but the pygmies had their brother tribe called the Watusis, what you know what I mean, or the Dinka, the Dang, behind them now protect them because they saw the pygmies as gods. You follow? So they had to ease their way in. So over a period of time, they snuck their way in the same way they snuck their way into America. They came from France, they came from Poland, they came from Scotland, they came from either easily here, and then eventually took over the country and called it theirs. They did the exact same thing in ancient Egypt. They eased their way in, and eventually they established themselves as the Hiket Chasus, or the Hyksos, some people say shepherd kings, others call them shepherd prisoners. They call them shepherd prisoners because the implication is that they were in bondage in Egypt, and it wasn't even in Egypt, they were in Memphis. When you say in Egypt, like I say I'm in the United States, and but I'm only in Georgia. And it's better to say I'm in Georgia. But they said we rule Egypt when in fact they only ruled Memphis. And that was for only 400 years before Atmos in them rose up again. You look at Atmos, you see he belongs to the original Nuban tribes, conquered them and chased them back to the land of Canada. This is all in history, and that's around the 17th to the 19th dynasty. And our lodges base our teachings on the man. It's called Sukhenwe Toa, right? But right? he was the man, a Toa or a Taite, that had the secret that these Israelites, these three Israelites, the first three sons of Jacob, Reuben, Simon, and Levi, wanted. Levi got most of the secrets the Levites, and set up a priesthood called the Brotherhood of Leviathan. And they became the law over the scriptures. They knew all the Egyptian laws, but they didn't get the passwords, and they didn't get the master's key, which was hidden in the ninth chamber by Namuz, who got it when he came in. If all of, so they were in by it, and that's your whole Israelite story. So when you deal with that Bible and trying to compare it to the Egyptian and the Samaritan, it flows very easy. Black Book Part 2 makes it very clear. It ties everything right up like I'm doing now and shows you the places to match it up. The way I teach is I spell out information and want you to sit down and bring it together. I want you to be a part of the learning process and start just dictating you like you're not a god. You are a god, so you're responsible. When I put that info out there, you're responsible to take the pieces and put the puzzle together and then say, aha, I see that. Sometimes I'll say something and say, I don't understand that. And you have to wait six months later, I'll walk around and start talking about that. Then you go, I passed the missing piece of that puzzle. That's my methodology. You know what I'm saying? That makes you a part of the learning process, and therefore it makes it something that you know, not something that you were taught. Like education, all right? Yeah, it's all. Well, all right. Hey, brother. I have a question. Um, from the Revelation chapter 12, where it talks about the birth of the woman and the Savior. The birth uh, of the child, not the woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, it's all right. The child. Um, and uh, I, I mean, refer to uh, Leo, Leo and the uh, constellation. Well, as Shriners or those in the lodge, I will be taught to look for the sign of Leo. First of all, what those signs? <laughs> First of all, Shriners are not in lodges. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and right? For those of us in the lodge, go ahead. And for the Shriners right. in the temple, or whatever right. they be, I would I would taught to look for that sign. Oh, we will be talking. Alright. What happened 
is the uh, Europeans came in, a group of them, under Albert Pike and Madam Black Ovesky. The reason why they refer to her as Madam Black Ovesky, why she did the thing about the ISIS papers, is because she used to provide the prostitutes for all of the Masonic parties in London when they was acting a fool. Right? You know the whole story about Sherlock and all that. Okay, now what happened is, they were trying to get the sacred words that the Moors in Yorkshire, London, had given them. If you look on the crest, and I did it in a book called, uh, Let's Set the Record Straight, I showed you the different crests to show you that all throughout London, all the original people in Yorkshire were all Moors. And I gave the crest to uh, Scotland, and I showed you all of them were Moors. Then I gave you the ones to the um, Irish, where we use the word Mac, and I showed you they were Moors. So what happened was indigenous people were being taught by a group of Moors who came up from Senegal all the way to Morocco and throughout Europe, and they were civilizing the devil, who was uncivilized, right? And what they were doing as we were taught, we were like teaching them to swear off their actions and round out their deeds. In other words, we saw them, we looked at them as raw human beasts. And we had to say, straighten up, cut that stick. Straighten up, cut that stick. Straighten up, cut that stick. Straighten up. And we said, the only way we can keep them is to say, listen, we're going to take you into this brotherhood, and we're going to give you a couple of secrets of life. You understand? And I want you to abide by those secrets, and I don't want no trouble out y'all up in here. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to hear this out in the street. So the Moors started to teach these people, and it straightened them up, straightened up their posture. And they, man, you know what they became in London? They became the most intellectual of all Caucasians. You know that? In London, they got the highest degree of intelligence in all white people on the planet. What do they call it, please? Huh? Central intelligence, what is it? Oxford University. Nope. Not Oxford. The government. It's owned by the government. Come on. Scotland Yard. <laughs> they got all the archives of all the sacred societies in the world there. And that was given to them by more. That's why they call it Scottish Rites. But in London or in Britain, I get confused. They call it Scotland Yard. Yeah, that's you know where the yard stick is. You follow? So this is why they are keeping it there. Go back around. One of the things that they knew of in the teachings is that Jesus did not die on the cross. Not the one 2,000 years ago. They knew about the transformation of the nature of the man on the cross. And when he transformed from man to God, back to man, and then the ninth hour when he gave up his soul. You read the Bible and you talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What most Christians miss is that there's a double portion taking place. When the man is on the cross, two things happen. One of them is, he says, Eli, Eli, let me say this My God, my God, why have thou for Satan? The word forsaken there is about that he needs to go away or leave or depart from. Now imagine the man on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have thou left me? What does that mean to Jesus? But the night before, when they were beating him and putting thorns on his head, he didn't complain. When they drug him before a punctured pallet and questioned him, he just said, who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? He never bent to the stature of a man. He remained a God through that whole period of time. You understand? Because can any man remove your sin? No. Only God can remove your sins. But they said that John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan Judea for the what? The remission of sin. So what part of John was at work moving the sins out of everybody? The second portion of the sin is God. 
people, please. And they said, a Holy Ghost descended like a dove and lighted upon him to stay there forever. And Jesus was lifted up out of the water. The power of God lifted him up and he met God halfway in heaven. And then from that point on, Jesus was no longer just a man. Now he was a man and God, because he had the double portion of the Spirit. Elijah couldn't even die because he had the Spirit of God. He went up in a chariot. They flew him away. Enoch couldn't die because Enoch had a double portion of the Spirit. So they said, we translated him. They had to make up words to get him out of here. Him. So now we come now to Jesus. And Jesus is approached by some mortals, some Levite priests, some men, after having been betrayed by Judas, one of his own. You know why? This ties into brother's question. You know why Jesus was betrayed by Judas? You know, I'm going to tell you why. But does anyone see why? Every time Jesus talked to one man, the same was down there. Go back and read the Bible. Every time Jesus talked to a woman, when Mary Magdalene washed Jesus' feet, Judas said that money could have been spent on something else. They were mad at him. Because he was talking to a woman. Yeah. When a woman came out of the fire of the land of Canaan, chapter 15, the disciples said, send her away, because she had already come to us. Don't touch the woman. All right? When Jesus was walking down the street, and they, oh, Jesus, come here, help us stone this woman. They want to watch and see what And Christ said, send her away. Let him, not her and him, not she and he, but let him who was without sin cast the first stone. All the men back up. You see that? Judas hated Jesus because of Jesus' attachment to women. Like Brutus, sounds like Judas. Hated Caesar. Sounds like Jesus. For well, his attachment to Cleopatra. Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> you follow that? As if women are not supposed to be touched by God. It was a man thing in Israel. Man priesthood. Right? Man prophets. Women just stay in their place. I was born a Muslim. I know women stay in their place. You know what I mean? So now, John had no woman. There you go. John was on a mission. John didn't even have a life. John lived in the wilderness. That's sad. John didn't eat fried chicken. He ate locusts. He didn't wear the fancy priest robes like other people, right? John wore skins like who? Like Elijah. Because John had a purpose, y'all. John's purpose was to bring the Spirit of God over and put it into Christ. Amen. So that God would dwell with man on earth. In Christ. Amen. Sounds right. weird, doesn't it? But as usual, the devil moved on men through woman and incited the envy and jealousy in the disciples of Jesus Christ to make them raise up against him. And that's why Judas was mad. He had no other intelligent reason or something. Because even in St. John's, when they came out to stone Jesus, he said to them, what reason is going to stone you? They said, well, not because of the things you teach, but because you say, that you are God and the Son of God, when I see you, I see God. That's why we're going to tell you.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. It is over. Like, oh, man. The suffering, the passion, the pain. It is over. He says, under your hands, I send Satan, not your soul, back to you. I'm sending you now, God, my spirit. You already took your spirit and I'm going with it back to heaven. Now it's come down here with my spirit. And man, I'm suffering for them nine hours. But why was it necessary for him to suffer? Because he couldn't die as a God and would serve no purpose. If he died as a God for men, he would serve no purpose. He had to die as a man for men to know that he had suffered for their sins. And be willing sacrifices. So now we, he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Do you know what that means? Oh man. That means we gotta pick up the cross. And we gotta walk through the town of Jerusalem. And we're gonna get whipped along the way. And we're gonna stumble and we're gonna fall. And every now and then, somebody, that brother I told you about. He's going to help you, and he's going to help you like Simon, and help you carry the cross. Right? And they're going to whip you. They're going to beat you. And then they're going to try to stop you from thinking. They're going to put a crown of thorns on your head so you ain't able to make your own decisions. Stop thinking. Don't conform, niggas. Conform. We got a whole system plan for y'all. Be that. Don't be thinking for yourself. Don't be listening to Elijah or Malcolm or, or anybody. Listen to us. Correct? You got to carry that cross. And we're carrying that cross unto death. You understand that? He's telling us to carry that cross unto death. That we may be saved. Carry that cross to death. That you may be saved. Are you a willing sacrifice? The way Christ was willing to die for you. And John was willing to die for Christ. Are you willing to die? You me? So amongst them, he knew. And you read the Corinthians, he said, you know, Jesus prayed and teached up over 500 people. Most of them are still with us, but some of them fell back asleep. Many of them were called, a few are chosen and they ain't gonna make it. <laughs> he said, you know, out of that many, I get a few. And in that few, he sets up a brotherhood, a secret brotherhood, a secret sisterhood of people who have picked up the cross and are willing to die for what is right. That's who we are as Freemasons and Shriners. We are that heavenly host. We are God's army. We step away from the normal man, you see? And we say, make us a part of a structure that is strength, that is strong, that is firm. Take me, take me, you know, like this here, hat is all messed up. Take me and shake me. Your father, carve me down and put me in that wall and make me a part of a structure. But Jesus said in Matthew 24, not every rock on the temple of Jerusalem, every one of them stones are coming down. And we did. But you know what he said again? He said, take me down now, and in three days, I will ride, I'll build a temple again. It's a temple. Take me down now, this temple destroy my body, in three days I'll raise it again. They got all confused. He was talking about the three degrees. That's why if you read Matthew 24, he meets his disciples privately. First, anybody got a Bible again? First, he's meeting everybody on Mount Olive. You understand? Later, he said, he met his disciples privately and they started asking him questions. He said, you got to pass, you got to go to the priest's degrees. And on that third day, you'll be resurrected back to life. Nicodemus asked the same question about Freemasonry to Jesus. He said to Jesus, how can I? He said, he said, well, unless you're born again, you won't see the king of heaven. Nicodemus said, born again, you gotta die and go on the hook of my mother. Jesus was like, okay. <laughs> you ain't no brother, see? 
You don't know. So I got to tell you what you got to do. You go out there and hang out with the disciples, right? And they'll take you through some trials and tribulations. You pay a little wages. You know, you be on another room outside. You come and win. And then I'll walk you through and you're going to make it. And you resurrect. And when you come back to life, you know what I mean by a new body. You know what I mean by a new body in Christ. Because a Freemason is a new body in Christ. Because he has given up manhood for Christhood. You follow that? And the Shriner bears a sword of power that we will be there for the second coming by the Christians and the Muslims and the first coming by the Jews. We don't care which one of them are right about if it's his second coming as El Messiah or Hamashiach. We don't care about the words all we know is that when we got past Mark and got through Matthew and saw the life of a man who came to earth and became a God, then we knew he said, what? There's many things I have to say unto you, however you cannot bear them yet. So I'm going to send somebody else. He's going to be a paraclete, a comforter, a moezer. In the book of Barnabas, he's called Ahmed, found in song. Right? He shall not speak of himself. Only that which he hears shall he speak. And he shall glorify my holy name. Hello? He'll be filled of the Holy Ghost. So was John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was born the exact same way Christ was. Exact same way. <coughs> Follow? Read the Bible. He had been born of the Holy Ghost. Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost. And Muhammad of Arabia was born of the Holy Ghost. Even if the Muslims today have perverted the teachings because that was originally a Christian sect, Islam. Now they got Mohammedism and a million different sects and they all think they're right. The original teachings was Ikra That's the first thing that was said, Ikra, Ikra. Ya Muhammad, Ikra, read. Read what, Muhammad? You sitting up in a cave in the dark by yourself? So whoever was standing there must have had a book with them or something because Muhammad was under the tree fasting and the Quran hadn't come yet. So when the angel Gabriel called Jibrael to the Muslims said to Muhammad, Muhammad, Ikram. He had to be showing him something. He had to be showing him the teachings of a Lord, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Muslims say. Not Allah. It doesn't say, read the name of Allah. It says, read the name of your Lord. Read the name of the rabbi. And let me tell you this. Islam as a religion had not been established yet. Because in the Quran, the religion on earth was Christianity. And that's why it was Khadija's uncle, who was a Christian and preserver of the Bible, who was Maria. teaching Muhammad. Maria. Right, am I right? And told Muhammad, right, that you are a prophet. A Christian told Muhammad that he was a prophet. And in the Bible, if the word is Quran in the Quran, if you listen to what I'm saying close in Arabic, you hear, if Quran, Bismi Rabbika. Rabbika. Allah Khalka. It says, We in the name of your Rabbi, your Rabbi, who creates. Now, Rabbi is not a common term used in Islam. Because this event that was taking place was taking place before the birth of Islam, as they know. The Rabbi they were talking about was the same Rabbi that Mary Magdalene said. Rabuni. <laughs> when she figured out who Christ was in the garden, she said, Rabuni. Yeah, Rabuni, my rabbi. Rabuni, you are my personal rabbi. So the angel Gabriel, and we know that the angel Gabriel brought the message to Mary. Say, hell, Mary, God, I have chosen of all the women of the world that you are going to conceive of the Holy Ghost. 